Good morning and good afternoon, rather, everybody here on Sci Fiction, Sci Fiction Official on YouTube, Sci Fiction on Twitter, Sci Fiction SW Star Wars page, and Sci Fiction on Twitch. We are coming to you live today on all simulcast streams. <clears throat> everybody join in the broadcast here. We are going to be later on talking with a gentleman who runs an amazing science fiction web platform and blog. His name is Jason Hunt. He runs Sci Fi For Me. Dot com. So check it out. We'll be coming here shortly. We're going to go over a few news items here. We have lots of goodies. We're putting more goodies up on the site as well. We've got, looks like this week, uh, Babylon 5 original, Babylon 5 stars, and new members are going to be uniting for a Babylon 5 The Road Home, which is an animated Babylon 5. Uh, I know we've lost a, lot of, a few of the members from the original uh, Babylon 5 cast, but... Uh, they will be reuniting in this new awesome animated thing put on by the exact same guy, uh, J. Michael Straczynski, who did the original. So that would be pretty cool. Ahsoka showrunner Dave Filoni says Thrawn is the New Republic's big bad. I mean, he's going to be heavily focused on in the new Ahsoka television series. And then another Star Wars trending news item. Andor showrunner Tony Gilroy ceases production on the hit show due to the writer strike stuff. He's no longer going to be writing on that, so hopefully they solve that writer strike uh, because uh, everything's kind of suffering in the streaming realm, sci-fi, and beyond. Marvel's Secret Invasion was inspired by classic espionage noir. Check that article out on SciFiction.com. It's got Samuel L. Jackson's picture on the cover. We just had Guardians of the Galaxy drop last week. We went and did that. We got a review. Also, if you go to our YouTube channel, the featured video on our YouTube channel, you can watch that for a second. I'll show you a little something here. Hold on. Let me see if I can get the, the screen up here. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Here. We got YouTube. We're going to share this screen right quick. But I'll have to share the hair. Hold on a second. Get down to it. I'll share this right quick. Y'all are going to love this. This is super cool what I'm about to share with y'all. So we got... That's me. Whoa! This is Sci Fiction's YouTube. We're going to share that. I want to show y'all something here. This here uses an artificial intelligence-like text-to-speech avatar with my head. And this is our Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 video review. Advertisement goodness. I'm not logged into the system. Sure feels good when you get it right. Advertisers, so I tell you. And with what. Philips Sonicare technology, it's Pause. easy to always get brush. Right. Let's see if we can get this going here. Here it is. The best of the three villains. We wind it here. The Guardians of the Galaxy franchise has captured the hearts of Marvel fans since its introduction almost a decade ago. Despite the significant changes in the characters and their universe, they remain as entertaining as ever. In That's Guardians an avatar. Sure, tied up a little bit. The main it's an avatar. This film is the core group and their relationships. Ooh, director James Gunn knows these misfits extremely well. This is well. the uh, new technology we're working on to debut. All of them find different new things, to continue ranging from uh, promoting contests, anything beyond. Where is the weakest That's link apart from one amazing right sequence? Right the film largely. Bring that off there for a second. But yeah, that's basically that that stuff there. We've got a few other trending news items. Indiana Jones is going to be released in theaters, and it's coming out on a 4K Ultra UHD release, which we're really looking forward to that. Let me get back to the site here. Share this up here. There you go. So there's that. Of course, Dune 2 is coming out. They dropped the trailer for that recently. We've got a little bit of television news here. Of course, we got the uh, so you'll know to Andor and Dave Filoni for events. We're going to be covering some events coming up soon, uh, restructuring a few things in the business aspect pertaining to media division. But we will be going to uh, cover full throttle like Beggars Canyon back home, the Star Trek event in Las Vegas. But before that, we're going to be going to San Diego Comic Con. Shout out to our friend. At uh, Gen Seven Comics for that, uh, his name is Alan Link. Go follow his page at Gen Seven Comics. Super cool uh, books he does. Superhero, a little mix of everything. Stuff like Blade Runner. I think he's working on a new project. He's going to be debuting at San Diego Comic Con. So go check that out. There may even be some well-known people down there that may be at his booth. Can't tell you who. Can't tell you what. 
But come down there and uh, down at the uh, Gen 7 Comics booth at San Diego Comic Con and check it all out for yourself. So it's going to be awesome. We'll be bringing in on Jason here in a second from sci fi for mecom Check it. His website's really cool. Ah, uh, T. It's a uh, sweet tea, but it's unsweet tea. That's sweet with sugar. Let's put it on. So we got that. And the uh, his site, yeah, his site has a variety of original programming, some super cool stuff. Each morning, he starts one called From the Bunker. It's like his layer, and he has his base of command where he talks about all the trending topics in sci-fi and fantasy and horror, all kind of goodies. He's also got some other shows. I'll let him tell you more about the other series he's got on there and different podcasts and things. They also cover events as well. So we're going to talk to him about that, just sci-fi goodness and beyond. Some of the events we're going to be going to here soon are San Diego Comic Con. We're going to be going down there from, uh, uh, let's see, the July 19th is preview. The 20th to the 23rd is the event. So we'll be down to the whole bulk of the event. We're going to be coming down there doing live streams, uh, doing interviews, everything and beyond covering the whole thing. Have a lot, a lot of fun with that. And we are going to be going to, right after that, for people that are just joining us on the broadcast, we will be going to Star Trek Las Vegas. Star Trek event put on by Creation Entertainment, Las Vegas, Nevada, at the Rio Hotel. And it is taking place April, excuse me, August the 3rd through August the 6th. Uh, we're going to be going down there with some good buddies of ours, Mr. Jacob Charlot, who's a brilliant actor, a super nice dude. Ethan McDowell, who's also an actor, who's been in Doom Patrol, Walking Dead. You've probably seen him on Ms. Marvel and all the goodies. Um, and a show on February, which was a, uh, a really cool series. Not really sci-fi, but it was a cool television series. I think we have Jason here on the on the waiting room here. Let's see if we can get him on here. Jason, how's it going, man? Oh, good. How are you? Doing pretty good, man. Just getting all the news items out, as you know. <laughs> All right, did uh, what? Am I late? I was thinking. No, I you're was, good. We're just gonna okay, start. We're right. a little early. It's going up. I'm I'm pretty much wrapped up with that. So we'll start the broadcast, man. All right. Do I look? Do I look dark to anybody else besides me? Mm, I think I need to. A little bit. I mean, it yeah. looks good. High res is dark, but not too dark. Yeah, I can right, see. Let me see if I can adjust that a little bit while we talk. So, right. cool. How's it going? It's going good. I'll put your name up here. There it goes. There's your website as well. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, everything's going good. We're just going over events and things are going to be covering up soon. Uh, you got any events going on here soon as well? Or? Uh, we do not, but uh, I could I could take that opportunity to mention that we maintain over on the dot com. We have a master list uh, yep. of conventions uh, around the world, and we just crossed twenty five hundred Wow. On that list, uh, these are all active and uh, uh, current mm. conventions that are everywhere around the world. So any any of those uh, cool. places, there we go. Though no. there you're bright enough. <laughs> but yeah, over on the dot com, we have uh, we have 2,500 on the list, and that includes uh, you know, Comic book conventions, horror conventions, cosplay cons, uh, anime cons, furry cons. And we've got a Google Calendar embedded on that page as well, so you can see when they happen. And uh, we're working on making that database searchable so you can go through and find the one that you're looking for. Right now, it's alphabetical. Are there websites you click, or how does that work? Yeah, everything's everything's linked, so it's a big big alphabetical list of all the Comic Cons that we've been able to find. And then all of them that have some kind of online presence, whether it's a website or a Facebook mm-hmm. page or something, we'll, we'll have a link that pops out to that. Very cool. You do a lot of original like broadcast things you've got on your, your site. What kind yes. of uh, shows do you do on that? Exactly. You've got your original one you do each morning as well. Yeah, we have uh, Live from the Bunker, which is Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, which is sort of kind of I, – I describe it sort of as – Larry King live or inside the actor studio with a, with a, nice. with a science fiction filter on it. We, we yeah. talk to uh, authors and creators. Uh, we have various different, it's, it's mostly a talk interview type of program. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we have the H2O podcast, which is on Tuesday nights, uh, Tim Harvey and myself covering various different topics. Tonight's tonight's show. We're going to be talking about, uh, series finales that didn't quite land right. 
Nice. Uh, we're going to be talking about that. We talked about CinemaCon news. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll have a you know occasionally we'll have guests that will come on that are you know our expert pundits and and that sort of thing. Right. Uh, then we have um, Good Morning Multiverse, which is our Saturday morning news program, which is all the headlines of the week in science fiction, fantasy, horror, video games, comic books, and such. And out of that comes Salacious Crumbs, which is our Star Wars news segment. Yeah. And Triple Bites, which is our Star Trek news segment. And then uh, we have Vault of the Killer Bees, which looks at the, you know, the drive-in movie schlock B-movie. The set. retro stuff. The, the retro stuff. stuff. Yeah. And then we have uh, Ranker Pit, which is every other Thursday. It's our discussion program regarding star wars so we have a very news cool. program we have a talk program about it very cool so that's so what we're at currently in production that's a whole like it's like a network right there man. yeah <laughs> oh, it's yeah. Awesome. yeah well cool. my approach has been to treat this like a regular tv network tv yeah. channel and um in that regard we're kind of light on programs but i can only do so much in a day so <laughs> sure. so you, you do a podcast as well i believe right uh, two of our programs get converted into right. audio. So Live from the Bunker and the H2O podcast uh, get converted to audio form, and then they go over to the podcast platforms. And then uh, Tim produces a third one that we host uh, called Zompocalypse Now, which is basically mm. the zombie horror stuff that Very spun cool. out of our programs, but it's they've got that on their own now. So where do you find those, like, like iTunes, Spreaker? Where, where are those located at? Uh, everywhere. I mean, pr- pretty much any any podcast platform you can find it. We're on uh, we're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Amazon Podcasts, uh, iHeartRadio, um, yeah. Double Twist. Uh, it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much everywhere that you can find a. You just Spotify. Uh, we're on a number of uh, number of platforms. Let me see if I can pull this up the list here. Um, yeah, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Amazon Music, TuneIn, Stitcher, Apple, Double Twist, Listen Notes, Pocket Casts. So oh, wow. all of those places you can find the like all, the, all the good ones. Yeah, yeah, very cool. You the, just, uh, Sci-Fi for me, and we we should you just Google up. it, and it'll show everything up. Yep, very cool. There's a lot of stuff going on in sci-fi now. Of course, we've got this writer strike thing going on. What are your thoughts on that? How long do you think that's going to last? Uh, well, it's not going to be done anytime soon. And depending on who you talk to, uh, it could be uh, a matter of weeks. It could yeah. be a few months. And I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, you know, it the terms that they're that they're going for some of the stuff that they want is in terms of compensation the writers they do have some legitimate concerns in terms of of how the streaming networks go what your residuals are going to look like and that kind of thing because it's it's uncharted territory it's wild wild right. west yeah. at the same time though uh this does present an opportunity to the studios to hold out long enough mm. uh we had uh, cameron pasha on last thursday and he was talking his theory is that in part the studios could be looking at this as an opportunity to go far enough out that they can force majeure some of these projects that that could be problematic for them right and they can get rid of these projects by default simply because we've gone long enough that the contracts have expired or you know some some right. you know circumstances beyond our control and so these projects go out and if the studios are looking at some of these actors and directors and writers Mm. and seeing how political and ideological they've gotten with their their public personas right you know maybe maybe it's not a bad idea that we get rid of some of these projects that are not going to appeal to a broad audience you know right. if we're if we're spending almost all, all this time making message message right. instead of just doing something that entertains because mm-hmm. you know that that stuff is kind of fallen by the wayside now what, what's audience. some of the shows you enjoy right now that you're what, reviewing or anything you really enjoyed as a recent well, I just uh, yesterday talked about uh, the the first season of Quantum Leap 2.0. Mm. I want to like it. There's pieces of it that I think are pretty good. Yeah. 
Uh, but I'm getting to the point now where a lot of these remakes, and I and I stumbled on this comparison when I'm when I'm watching Quantum Leap, but I think it applies to a number of others. Mm. Uh, the people who are making the sequels, the remakes, the reboots, and whatnot, they are working off the online copycat recipe. <laughs> Uh, you know the Red Lobster Cheddar uh, Bay biscuits that everybody loves. Those those biscuits from Red Lobster. The cheese biscuits. Can, yeah, the cheese biscuits. Well, they can you can find the the recipe online. Yeah, but it's not exactly the same. We found a pack of those in gluten free. Now you can get a, the batter. Yeah, but now if you buy the Red Lobster package, yeah, I mean that's the Red Lobster one. But if you right. decide to make your own using that recipe that you find online, and mm-hmm. it could be any you know. Texas Roadhouse dinner rolls, the same kind of thing. You know, it's yeah. it's not quite the same. All right. And some of these Similar. people are making it using the copycat recipe without knowing what it's supposed to taste like. And right. they get close, but and Quantum Leap 2.0 kind of feels like that. Yeah. It's not quite fan fiction. Right. It's it's a step above that, but it also there's pieces of it that are like it's not it's like does it take place like 30 years or something from the original or something like that? Not 30 years. Um I want to say probably 15 20 years after because the original was I think 1990 Oh yeah, it's 99. Yeah. So now I mean we're modern era for this one. Right. And you know projecting so back 20 years, roughly, yeah, about 20 years. And Ernie Hudson plays uh, Magic Williams, who was a character that Sam leaped into. Military guy, yeah. Yeah, the the Vietnam episodes with his brother. So there's there there are connections, and there are obvious connections, and there are some a little bit more subtle connections. So it's it is very clearly, definitively a sequel, but it's got some of the same challenges that most shows have during the first season. You know, they're still getting their legs under them, still figuring things out. Some things I I thought were better than I expected them to be. Mm. Other things, they're not quite there yet. Yeah, I mean, that original series of Quantum Leap was just such ahead of its time and such a cutting edge, you know, drama series. And you got the chemistry between Sam Beckett and Dean Stockwell's character. I mean, it was like lightning in a bottle, man. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to was. replicate that whole, the whole motif. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why Scott Bakula turned it down. Uh, yeah. as far as the notion of coming back. Now, the door is open for him to, to come back anytime he wants. But given the fact that Dean Stockwell is no longer with us, yeah. you know, he does, Bacula doesn't quite have as much incentive to come back and play Sam. Right. So, Unless it's on uh, Stephen Colbert. <laughs> <laughs> well. But, so uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, other stuff that I'm looking at. I mean, uh, Strange New Worlds is out there, and and I thought I thought it's it's okay. I I, I enjoyed Picard season three. Yeah. Um, I haven't really been watching a whole lot uh, of late, just simply because I've been so busy. But, am, but there's there's some there's some gems out there. There are some nuggets. Uh, occasionally, you'll you'll stumble across one. But I've been I've been going back. Uh, I've been taking my wife through the original Star Trek. Oh man, uh, we just serious. finished Deep Space exactly. Nine, so you know I'm I'm catching her up more than I am you know concentrating on anything current. What about the uh, any of the Star Wars stuff? Any of that stuff you like it, and some stuff you may not like like as much? Or? Um, in terms of Disney Star Wars, yeah, not so much. Um, Andor's okay. I I can appreciate it for what they're trying to do. The rest of it, nah, I take or leave it. Obi Wan was a joke. Uh, was I thought, it was, I thought it was, it was uh, the battle sequence. Everybody gets on that. It was supposed to be the first time they met was in the New Hope, so they have another battle. Yeah, sequence. well, there's that. I mean, you've got all sorts of continuity logic bombs right in the middle of it, but right. but the the entire series was executed so poorly. Mm. And written so terribly. I mean, it's garbage tier stuff. And <laughs> think they'll do a second season? <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I think they would like for them to be. Yeah. But it was a limited series to begin with, and and That's I don't. Right, it was think, a mini series, like a small. Yeah, segment. I don't. I don't think anybody's. There's not enough interest outside of the. Froze up there for a second. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't think there's enough interest outside of Lucasfilm to make any more of that show. Nor should what there would you, I mean, What would you like to see in Star Wars? If they were to make a show, something really cool, what would you like to see them do it if they did it right? I don't think they can do it right. <laughs> I don't think I don't think current I don't think Disney Lucasfilm can can yeah. can figure it out. John Favreau probably has the best chance of doing it, but he's yeah. been sidelined and sabotaged since you know, you know, firing Gina Carano was just the first piece of that. But you know, the interference that he has had to suffer, at least according to rumor. Yeah. But this overall plan that he had with Rangers of the New Republic and Ahsoka mm-hmm. and all these, you know, this whole Mandoverse thing basically has been shot in the head. And if the yeah. latest rumors are true, Favreau's just pretty much given up at this point. Yeah, whatever. Done. And so then you got this writer's like, strike thing going on too now. On yeah, the writer's strike is going to complicate everything. And not only is the writer's strike here, but you also have SAG AFTRA, which is next, the Directors Guild, which is also next, because their contracts are coming up here at the end of June. Mm. And then the American uh, cinema editors are also now starting to make noise. And so are the makeup people. So you could have, by the end of the year, you could have all of the unions gone, shut oh, down, wow. and decide not to. Because, you know, and even then, they, there could be some, maybe they don't go on strike, but as we saw in New York with Daredevil Born Again, mm-hmm. the Teamsters and the local unions refused to cross Writers Guild line. Right. So even though my union's not striking, we're not going to cross the picket line of that union that's striking. So Daredevil had to shut down production right. because the other unions are honoring the strike from the Writers Guild. So wow. everything is going to be complicated <laughs> for a while. Right. What about literature? You, you know, like books or any cool like comic book related? So any kind of books that you're looking at these days which i've seen or i i have i have piles of books everywhere <laughs> i've got stuff uh my review queue dates back to 2012 i've still got okay. stuff that i got a review from that that far back um stuff that i like to read just yeah. leisure reading uh there's the honor harrington series from david weber uh old star trek novels uh you know i've got i've got Dragon Riders of Pern, I've got Tolkien, I've got Heinlein, I've got Bradbury. I mean, I've got all sorts of stuff. All the goodies. Yeah. Very cool. What was, um? you've got a lot of stuff going on. You mentioned like messages and science fiction, like agendas and stuff like that. What do you see like, I mean, we're kind of living in like, we've talked about this before, but it's kind of like this modern day, like, oh man, it's like getting wilder and wilder and wilder these days. And you've got, you know, not just politics, but cinema, and it kind of all spills into the kind of a matrix like kind of effect and so on. What do you think like that is like, you know, what are your words of like how that relates to like all this stuff that's going external from the entertainment industry and in the entertainment industry as a whole, you know? Well, first of all, the premise, the premise that that's separate from the entertainment industry is flawed. Um, Andrew Breitbart said that, that politics was downstream from culture. And when you have the culture war, as people Mm -hmm. like to talk about, uh, there is an ideological uh, conflict between people, people on the very far left and everybody else. And you have this uh, this dichotomy of thought where you have people that are that are people that subscribe to Marxist theory, Mm -hmm. communist theory. Uh, who think that everybody else needs to just agree with them and go along. And the, there are certain people, not everybody in Hollywood is like this, and not everybody in Washington, D.C. is like this. Right. But you have this group of elites, and you can take political party out of it. It's not, it's not left versus right, red versus blue, right. liberal, conservative, de- Democrat, Republican. It's the elites and everybody else. And it creates this us versus them mentality mm-hmm. that we need to somehow break through. And I don't know the the, the real good way to do that, um, not peaceably anyway. <laughs> but you have people, and 
this is something we've talked about over on our Discord server. That various different people have made the observation that when you have somebody like an Elizabeth Banks, for example, when she when she came out and said, "Well, nobody watched my Charlie's Angels because they're all sexist," <laughs> and if you don't like the character of Reva and oh, Obi Wan, then yeah. you're a racist. You know, it's it's that if then you know set of absolutes, right? And one of the people that was in the in the Discord kind of touched on it. It's these people that are making these shows, mm -hmm. these movies, they identify ideologically so much with what they're creating mm -hmm. that any criticism of the creation, any criticism of the story, the, the movie, the TV show, the whatnot, they take it personally as a hit on them. Right. You're going to insult my story. I'm going to take it as an insult to me personally. And they're not able to separate the creator from the created work. Right. And so you have this defensiveness and protectiveness that creates this barrier where nobody is going to be able to get along. If I, you know, I'm not even allowed to criticize the last Jedi. I mean, how dare <laughs> yeah. you know, right? right. And, and you have this us versus them right. battle lines that are being drawn and nobody's going to be able to, to get past that barrier because there are people that are in the industry who are building that barrier up and they're using it as an excuse to attack anybody that criticizes them. Right. Was it uh, Ryan Johnson when they were bashing the last Jedi he called all the fans man babies and never yeah. apologized? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and you had uh, uh, Pablo Hidalgo going after mm -hmm. uh, the YouTuber Star Wars theory forgot about that for, for his emotional reaction to Luke Skywalker coming back in the Mandalorian. Yeah. You know, you've got a divide among fandom when it mm -hmm. comes to, you know, like Gina Carano. Mm -hmm. You know, Gina Carano posts some stuff online. People take offense to it and they they read something into it that's not there. Right. But the double standard is, you know, Pedro Pascal can compare Trump supporters to you know, the KKK and, and the Confederate army. But that's and okay. like, you, you can't have it both ways, right. but they want it to be both ways. And right. so, you know, there's this double standard, you know, rules for thee and not for me. And, and I, I don't see us getting past that anytime soon. What about just kind of a side off topic pertaining to like your know, entertainment? You've got a lot of uh, channels on like this TikTok thing. And what are your thoughts on that being, you know, parlayed in using this entertainment platform trying to get rid of that when you know the guy's been obviously cooperative and he's talking to a bunch of old curmudgeons on the stand that don't really know nothing about the, well, the so-called social media aspect there's there's two there's two aspects of that one you have uh you have a lot of information that's out there that that there's a preponderance of evidence that tiktok is owned by the at least run at mm -hmm. some access uh to the chinese communist party Right. The, the state, you know, the government of China, they have access to the TikTok. You're talking about the, uh, the tech itself. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The tech, that particular app, the information that's on there. And I, I think that it's prudent for government agencies to uh, tell their employees right. not to be using TikTok because of the sensitive nature of government information. We don't I want think they to let you have it on your phone in there. If, if you even work. Yeah. It, it depends. It depends. Uh, I think Christy Noem up in South Dakota, they just they just passed a bill that said no government employee can have it on their on their government issued phones. Right. So there are there are some obstacles being put in place. I think I think TikTok is spyware. <laughs> and could be. I think all of us. <laughs> the other the other aspect. Of, well, I mean, we live in a surveillance state. So, you know, Skynet is just, you know, two shakes away from from being a thing. We got all this stuff with like chat GPT. Yeah. They, uh, yeah. It's, wow, yeah. Man. I mean, that's that's a whole nother thing. But yeah. right now in Congress, you've got what's called the Restrict Act, yeah. which ostensibly is supposed to ban TikTok. But the thing is, a lot of people are comparing it to the Patriot Act, where mm. it gives the government a lot of authority to spy on citizens for any and every and and maybe not even a good reason and you know the things you post and the, and it's once it takes us one step closer to 
the social media scores being used. I mean, Australia just implemented this where you have to have 100 points of, of good social media credit in order to be able to access certain privileges. China's doing wow. it. Canada tried it mm -hmm. uh, under their emergency powers last year when the truckers were doing all of their protests, you know, the emergency, uh, the emergency powers act, they went to the banks and they said, shut these people down. And, and people who had anything to do with the trucker protests mm -hmm. found their bank accounts frozen. They couldn't get access to their money. Wow. And that's the kind of thing that they want to do here. You know, we don't like your tweet. You want, you want to get your, you want to make an ATM withdrawal delete See. this post that and that's that's what they want to do that's that's yeah. they want to control the the interactions they want to control the dialogue they want to control the narrative and if we can make sure that you're not talking to each other you mm -hmm. can't compare notes you don't really know what's going on other than what we media and and government mouthpieces will tell you mm -hmm. and at that point you don't know anything about what's what's true or not I mean, we, we've, we've, there's all sorts of examples of the media lying to us over the last five years, especially. Revisions of stories, all kind of jazz. Yeah. And well, and that's the other thing too. I mean, what they're doing with Roald Dahl and, and R.L. Stein and now Agatha Christie and, and it's, we're living in 1984. More or less. <laughs> all of the histories were rewritten. All of the, all of the past has been revised. Taking and, down statues and all that stuff to a famous yeah. historical figure. And nobody knows what's true or not. What about the uh, overall? Like you know, we both deal in sci-fi uh, and, and you know, fantasy horror, all that good awesomeness. What do you see if things can get better? Like, what would you like to see, or what, what, what would you see just as a forecast for maybe like the next few years in the entertainment world? If we, you know, progressing by based on what's going now and all this stuff. If if I if I could wave the magic wand. Mm -hmm. Um, ideally you would have Kathleen Kennedy retire. Mm. Disney would sell Lucasfilm and Marvel. Mm. And I think that's coming. Where would they sell that to? Uh, I think they'll sell, they, they could possibly sell Lucasfilm to Apple. Oh, yeah. Marvel. They'll probably keep, mm. but, uh, I think if they get rid of Lucasfilm, they'd sell it to Apple. Because uh, there, there's rumor that that discussion has been had since mm. Bob Iger's come back. Because they replaced the other the, the guy, and that's Iger's back now from uh, yeah. CEO of Disney. Right. And, you know, Pixar probably would go with it. Mm. Um, because Pixar actually started as a division of Lucasfilm. Yes. When, when Lucasfilm first started looking at computer animation, Pixar was the program that they developed. And uh, then Lucas sold it to sold it to Dobbs, and and then Disney bought it out. And and if they get rid of Lucasfilm, they'd sell it to Apple because Apple's really the only one big enough to take it. Pretty much, yeah. Was Unless they sell it back to George, I don't think George would buy it back, but he might. You know, Maybe. I mean, yeah. he's kind of said he's retired at this point. You know, I mean, from filmmaking, he is. But when he sits there and and right after selling it to Disney. Mm. compares Disney to white slavers. White slavers. <laughs> when something happened between then and right. then, hold on. And and if <laughs> if Lucas were to buy it back, yeah. I would think that his mo his sole motivation would be preserving the legacy of what he built before Disney bought it. Right. I don't know that he would actively pursue producing anything himself. Yeah. But just to have his hands on the wheel and say mine and and bring in an inner circle of creatives that he trusts to preserve the legacy of star wars right. and build it back and sit there and say okay all this disney stuff mm. not canon we're just gonna throw it out <laughs> like disney like disney did with the eu right well we can do it with the disney stuff so i right. i, I what I, is real <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was all a fever dream <laughs> you know, you know, you wake up, you find Bobby in the shower. That's right. That's right. Same it's thing. Like the second two Matrix films just being the dream that I had or something. Like that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, I had a um, funny story. You mentioned uh, Pixar animation. A buddy of ours, um, he was uh, it was working down there doing something with uh, over at Pixar, and uh, George Lucas was there. Ray Harryhausen was there. 
and they were talking about all this computer. So like, this is the future, and we're Harry houses and something like going like, I don't know what any of this stuff is. He's all stop <laughs> animation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, when Jurassic Park was in development, uh, there's a there's a special there's a special on Industrial Light and Magic uh, on Disney Plus right now. Phil Tippett. Yeah. And Phil Tippett. Phil Tippett's career was done. Yeah. You know, when they started talking about, you know, our our CG has gotten so good that we can do this stuff. Yeah. You know, Phil Tippett's career cratered. He yeah. saw it. Right. I mean, you, you, he's, he's in his interview. He says, I'm looking at this and I know that I'm done. And it destroyed him after that because he, you know, stop motion was done. There, right. there was gone. And they brought him in to consult and, and still figure out the designs and the movement and all that other stuff. But stop motion never recovered from that. Right. And there were so many animators and, and Tippett was the main one. Uh, but everybody that was that was invested in stop motion at all mm -hmm. uh, were just were just destroyed at that point by by ILM and their and their computer generated stuff. And, you know, people are concerned about AI doing the same thing to writers. Mm -hmm. AI is not that sophisticated yet. Although, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking to Paul Chatto. He was he was a network executive on Big Canada. And he sees some usefulness to it because if I'm if I'm going to do a, a, a TV series set in Victorian era, you know, Elizabethan era England, you know, mm -hmm. 1700s. I can give the AI the parameters. The AI can go fish around for all of the all of the documentation and do the homework and the research and the whatnot, right. and then come back in, and then I can take that raw material and refine it into a story. Right. Um, the Writers Guild still requires a human presence. So even even in this, you know, with this concern about AI replacing writers, mm -hmm. I see AI possibly being a research tool. A first draft type of thing right but at this at, at the end of all of it you still have to have somebody who actually writes the script and puts their name on it and said this is mine right. so it's only going to be useful up to a certain point now when you get two or three or four seasons of a show mm. and you crank all of that into the ai and say okay give me some new scripts that are similar to these 50 that we've already done right. maybe you've got a little bit more of a challenge to the writer's room mm -hmm. but i don't think you've got enough writer producers showrunners who are writers i don't think they're going to let things get that far out of control out of their hands the bean counters might love it <laughs> but ai cannot duplicate the creative spark that you get from a from a real person it, it can mimic things but it doesn't have the ability to create it can only do what you tell it to do and it can only do it as well as the information that it has in order the to search do it. For it. Right. so you know it's it, it's yeah i don't i don't think ai is that much of a threat yet but yes. <laughs> it it could be right. at some point. The uh, talk about Chat GPT and stuff like that. Have you seen these um, services that are popping up? There's several of them. A few of them. They have um, these. They call them you know, avatars, but presenters. Have you seen? Oh, any, yeah. Have you seen those? I have. Yeah. What do you think yeah. about that technology? Perhaps being used in entertainment or something like that. Oh, we're already seeing it. I mean, you you look at. I mean, we mentioned Luke Skywalker showing up at the end of, of the Mandalorian. Uh, you like know, they, motion track capture. Yeah. Face replacement, yeah. motion capture. Uh, they can do it with faces. They can do it with voices. There's a, a company out of Ukraine called Respeacher. Mm -hmm. And they did uh, the Darth Vader work and, and the Luke Skywalker work in Mandalorian. But they did the Darth oh. Vader work in uh, Obi-Wan and Rogue One. Mm -hmm basically taking james earl jones's voice mm -hmm. he records the dialogue and then they right. process it through this thing to make it sound like he did back then right and lucasfilm has bought the rights to james earl jones's voice 
<laughs> so <laughs> in perpetuity forever and ever, James Earl Jones will be the voice of Darth Vader, whether he's alive and recording it or not. That's amazing. They will, uh, I could record Darth Vader's lines mm -hmm. and they could go in and they could just overlay James Earl Jones right on top. And, and he's doing the voice of Darth Vader. Mm. Uh, I think you're going to get to the point, you know, we saw, what was it back in the nineties mm -hmm. diet, Pe diet Coke. Mm -hmm. They did these commercials with Elton John and Louis Armstrong and Humphrey Bogart. And it was like, wait a minute, half of these people are dead. <laughs> what are you doing? And right. it was a novelty at the time. And it certainly got people talking about it. But even back then people were recognizing the danger of this. It was like, well, hang on. If you do this, you know, there was a John, there was a, uh, what was it? A Coors, there was a beer commercial and they had, they had John Wayne in it, you know, mm -hmm. no, this is creepy. Don't do this. But now here we are where, you know, you can take Harrison Ford at 80 years old and mm -hmm. make him look like he's 35 again in, in the opening sequence of, of Dial of Destiny. Mm -hmm. You know, and oh, yeah, it made him look really young. <laughs> yeah, and and that's one of the reasons that's I'm I'm hearing that's one of the things that convinced Ford to do the movie is the fact that they could do that and get it so close. Because they've got so many samples of his face from all of the different things that he's done over the years. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take that much now. But we're that close, that close to 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 creating out of whole cloth a movie that stars James Dean, Marilyn Monroe, Elvis sure. Presley, Sean Connery. I mean, you name it, any, any of the dead actors, let's just throw them in there. As long as you make a deal with their estates, mm -hmm. you're going to be doing that. You know, dead men don't wear plaid with Steve Martin. They created <laughs> this whole movie, this whole story using clips from other film noir movies. Right. Well, this will th this will go a step further. This will create out of whole cloth. These actors, these digital actors, will now go and do whatever it is that you write in the story. You're not having to take clips and make them fit. You're right. taking dead people, the avatars of dead people, and making them do wholly new, brand new stuff. Is it? This is this is <laughs> this is a slippery slope yeah. because not only could I make an actor say things in a scene. I could also take you, Owen, and mm -hmm. I could create a digital avatar of you, and right. I can have you sit there and say, I like drowning babies, and nobody would know that it's not you. Right. You know, that's the danger of this. And John Favreau has even spoken about this and recognizes there's a danger to this because I can make you say anything. What about like you used in like horrified uh, national television for like, for like political figures and stuff too? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I could, you know, we, let's, and, and we've even seen samples of this. People have done this with Barack Obama. And Jordan Peele did Bush. with Barack, yeah. We can, we can make you say anything. And all it takes is one piece of a fake something somewhere and World War Three, or, a, a, you know, an economic collapse or, you know, a run on the banks or, you know, what, you name it. All it takes is one thing I can make, I can make it. And it is, it's, it's just got to be believable for long enough. And, you know, wag the dog. Is, I wag the dog has been possible for a number of years. And I, I've been convinced that we're living in a, in a world where the media creates a narrative and manipulates the public into believing it because they have agendas that run counter to the the health and safety and welfare of the general population and and we're we're getting into a time where civil unrest is going to be the rule rather the, than the exception this is 2023 2024 i think this year uh we will see another round of riots i think we'll see another another escalation in civil unrest um, yeah, it's, it's going to get bad. Yeah. I've, I've said for a while, we're, we're right now living at the intersection of 1984 animal farm, Fahrenheit 451 and brave new world. Sounds about right. And you could throw in the boys from Brazil. You could throw in, yeah. uh, uh, clockwork orange. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a great that. I'll come down, yeah. 
all of those. This is where we are in real life, not not in terms of, you know, the kind of stories we're, we're living in 1984 right now. And it is a scary time. Very scary. We've got we got somebody here, Ferenc Sheffer, I think his name is. Says hi. Uh, hi. He's there. Hi. <laughs> well, I want to before we end the broadcast, I wanted uh, everybody to. Uh, I want to first thank you for being on the broadcast. Sure. And second, I uh, wanted to see uh, what was all some of your links you wanted to give out, for, like your website and various uh, shows and things. We are pretty much on all of the different social media platforms: uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, Pinterest, MeWe, Minds, Gab, Parlor, Getter. Uh, we we're on, we're, yeah, we're on, uh, we're on uh, different video platforms. We're on YouTube, Twitch, Odyssey, and Rumble. Uh, we we do live video to to all four of those channels uh, pretty much all the time. And you know we have uh, you know, various different articles, news articles, and reviews over at the dot com, okay. and. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty. I mean, it just do a search for sci fi for me, uh, and you'll find us various different places. We're not on Snapchat, we're not on TikTok, <laughs> and we never will be. Neither do we are. As well. So, uh, Mr. Jason, it was a pleasure talking to you, sir. Absolutely. Beautiful Glad to be day. here. Thanks yes, for having sir. me. Yes, and Pete. Have a good day. You too.